Hi everyone, welcome to my course. I am so excited that you're here and go ahead and grab a cup of coffee or a warm drink. And this lecture is just gonna be a little short introductory lecture about me and who I am and why I'm here today. So basically, this slide is just showing you a little bit about my educational background and where I'm from and a picture of me in New Zealand, of course, with a New Zealand lamb. <laughs> and this was in my first year of vet school when I had to do my farm practicals and I was working on a sheep and dairy farm. The other photo is a picture of where I'm from originally. The country here with the red dot on it is Turkey, and I'm originally Turkish. My name is pronounced Hilal Doan, but don't worry about the pronunciation, you guys. Just you can call me Dr. Dogan. It's the easiest, honestly, or call me Hilal. However you want to pronounce it is totally okay with me don't worry. I've lived all over the world. My father was a Turkish diplomat, so we traveled and moved every few years to a new country or a new city, and I'm pretty used to people not knowing how to pronounce my name, so please do not worry about it. And then in terms of my educational background, I did my undergraduate degree at the University of San Diego, California, UCSD. Uh, this is the library photo that I did not take, but used to walk up to this library literally down this path on a regular basis going to study with dreams of initially going to medical school. And then I changed my mind and decided I want to become a veterinarian instead. So I finished my undergraduate degree in human biology here and then took a couple years to apply to vet schools and worked in California and volunteered while I was waiting to hear back from veterinary schools. And one of the places I worked was SeaWorld. And before you all come at me with pitchforks and before you cancel me, I just want to say this was before Blackfish. This was early 2000s. And no, I am not a uh, proponent of keeping large mammals in captivity. But the reason I was at SeaWorld was because I really wanted to work in rescue and rehab. And I knew that they had a rescue and rehab program for wildlife where they would basically go out, rescue injured or sick animals, rehabilitate them. And this is us um, trying to rehabilitate a baby dolphin that was found stranded. I have sunscreen all over my arm here because you have to put sunscreen on their fins so they don't get sunburnt. Uh, the baby dolphin had some sort of illness that made it unable to swim or eat properly. And so we would get in the water with it and try and um, keep it swimming, keep it alive and rehabilitate it and then get it healthy to go back out into the wild. And then there were still during that time, plenty of protesters even against rehabilitation of wildlife. So I know this is a touchy subject and even in New Zealand, I don't think they really are a proponent of programs that um, rehabilitate wildlife but I was really interested in it. And the people who worked in this de department, these guys, they're legends, they're amazing, they're badasses, they're just good at what they do and they love their jobs and it showed. I really enjoyed working here so much. I worked also in the pinniped department, in the husbandry department, and the education department where I would go around to different exhibits and talk about how we can learn and protect animals and conservation was a huge message 
that we always included in our lectures. So yes, while SeaWorld does get a bad, bad rap, I know that, um, this is me with the sea lion and they literally are like water dogs, basically. They're like so cute. It was so fun. I l never cared that I had to wake up at 4 a.m. to go to the fish house to prepare pair all the food for the morning to feed these guys because I just enjoyed it so much. It was so fun. And then I got into veterinary school and I did my veterinary education in New Zealand. This is us on a paddock somewhere, probably learning about grass and nutrition and cows. And it was just one of the best experiences ever. Highly, highly recommend Massey University in New Zealand. And then after that, I moved to Maui as a new graduate. First time being a vet on an island. Pretty crazy. Not a lot of support. Um, but it was an experience I wouldn't trade for the world. And I did everything there from small animals to bunnies to dogs, cats, horses, goats, anything and everything uh, because it's island medicine. And while I was in Maui, I started to do a lot of research into compassion fatigue. As a new graduate, I was definitely taken aback and somewhat disillusioned by the expectation that I had going into practice. And while this is no fault of the university or my education, it's just that I think there is still so much out there that is not documented, not talked about. And that was one of the motivations behind starting the Veterinary Confessionals Project, which is how you might know me. And I started this project when I was still in my senior year of veterinary school. Um, and it started initially as a wellness art project because I noticed that there was a lot of talk going on about how people were struggling in this profession. And then once I got out into practice, I also realized what everyone was talking about. And most of the information that I share in this course and this lecture series comes from the book, The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. And I've extrapolated this information to make it make sense for veterinary medicine. Because still, you guys, no one's talking about trauma in vet med or traumatic stress, not in an impactful way. And that's part of my mission is to keep spreading the word, keep talking about this, because it is so important to understand how this impacts us as veterinary professionals and animal caregivers. And so I went ahead and did a certification in traumatic stress via the International Academy of Traumatology, which basically just gave me the educational tools that I needed in order to lecture and talk about these topics and just overall understand it better. And every year I do go to the trauma conference to stay up to date on my certification for that. And so it's like on top of my veterinary uh, license, continuing education, I also do additional continuing education for these topics, which I just love, honestly, I think it's so interesting and I love sharing with you all about it because not everyone has all this time to go and do all this research and we rely on people who are doing the research to share what they learn with us. And I think that's so important because I just feel like our field has kind of gotten forgotten and I want to bring it back to the forefront and realize that veterinary professionals and animal healthcare workers deal with traumatic stress and caregiver stress as well. And the more we know about our struggles, the better equipped we are going to be to handle them. Because when I was at the last trauma conference, the live one before COVID, I just even brought it up to Bessel van der Kolk, who was there, and he was even surprised. So if like he's one of the leaders in the trauma field right now, and he doesn't even know that this is a thing in vet med, I mean, y'all, we got to We got to keep spreading the word. 
And then after Hawaii, I was there for three years, I moved to Denver, Colorado, where I continued to work as a veterinarian. I became predominantly a relief veterinarian at this point, and I still do relief regularly because I still love being on the floor. I just have learned how I need to practice in order to make my practice sustainable for me. And then I was also through this doing relief, I was able to make time to get my yoga teacher training certification. And I completed that in the summer of 2022. And this is my graduating class. We were all really excited because we were the first class to graduate after COVID and the studio had reopened and it was just a super exciting time. And then this is me and my friend, Christine Fox. She's a critical care specialist. And this is us trying to do cross country skiing because everyone in Colorado downhill skis and we just were trying to be different and try something new. It was definitely, I loved it. And then I also, throughout my career, honestly, even throughout vet school, was very involved in conferencing. And these photos are basically just me, a little snippet of what I've done in the industry. But basically, I started going to conferences, NAVC initially, before it became VMX. Started doing the TED-like talks there that were called Ignite. And they were just like short 15-minute talks, and I would talk about the Veterinary Confessionals Project and well-being and compassion fatigue, and then that turned into where I worked with DVM360 for five years before they got bought out by a new company, but during that time, it was such a great experience. I spoke at their conferences. I wrote tons of articles for them, both medical and non-medical, well-being and clinical, and did a, a ton of lectures, workshops, just really involved in the well-being field for our profession. So it's been great. <laughs> and now I'm here trying to be online as well because I realized that all that work I was doing, while it had an impact, I wanted it to have an even bigger impact. And make this content more accessible to people who can't travel for conferences or who are too busy working all the time or whatever the reasons are. So thank you for being here. And the Veterinary Confessionals Project is still going pretty strong. It is on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, all the social media handles, and the website veterinaryconfessionalsproject.com is still where you can submit anonymous confessions or secrets. Please do so if you feel compelled to share something anonymously. And I'm just going to share some of the initial secrets I just picked a handful in case you're not super familiar with the Veterinary Confessionals Project, but also because I just love sharing some of the most impactful ones that I feel like make sense for our profession. Like this one was the first one we ever got. And I think it's just such a great representation of the human animal bond. And it says, I miss my dead dog more than my dead mother. She was great. I loved her, but he was my size. I understood him. We needed each other equally. And I think that it's just so beautiful. Also, this black and white picture where this person clearly had a very special connection with her dog. And I think a lot of us can relate to that and why maybe we decided to go into this profession. And even if you are not necessarily a veterinarian or a technician, or you're just starting out, you know, I think everyone can relate to like that special connection you have that doesn't require real language. 
between an animal and yourself. And then this one is from a real live conference where it says, I want to be a vet because animals are so cute from Sabrina, who's five years old. And she drew a little picture of a little stick figure animal having a thought bubble with a heart towards who I'm guessing she's the one in the thought bubble. I'm not really sure. Or is she the animal thinking of? Anyway, the point is, I just love it. It's adorable. It reminds me of when I was a kid and how much I wanted to be a vet. And the funny thing is, so many people told me not to be a vet when I was younger and I never understood why. And then later I was like, oh, okay. I think I kind of understand why they were saying that, but honestly, I would have still become a vet. Like, I just think we need better education around self-care and not necessarily this like, oh, just don't become a vet with no explanation as to why. So that's another one of my missions is to try and spread more awareness around self-care if you're going into this profession, because it truly is a very fulfilling profession. And this one that says, I can't spell interception. I love this one because I couldn't even pronounce interception for the longest time. And to, I, to spell it is a whole nother thing. And I just love how this secret reflects our imperfections and how human we are and how we're going to make mistakes and we're not going to be able to spell things and that's okay. But sometimes it just feels like it's not okay because we can get real judgy. And I'm not saying like, you know, it's an excuse to be average or mediocre or not try. It's just you know, sometimes there's certain things we always mess up. Like I always mess mix up when I'm saying it out loud, metronidazole and met metoclopramide. I don't know why. Like sometimes I'll like just my brain, they sound so similar. And someone will be like, you mean metronidazole? And I was like, yes, why do they have to sound so similar? So just silly stuff like that. And I'm sure you have your own. And that's why I find this secret very relatable. And then this one, it was actually submitted at the first live conference I ever did when NAVC was still NAVC and not VMX. And I really what, remember this just feeling of like surprise when I read this confession because I was like, wow, like it says I'm losing my hearing, but I'm afraid for my clients to know. I'd quit if I thought it affected my job yet, underline yet, dot, dot, dot. But I'm very afraid for when that time comes. And when I read this, I realized like, oh my gosh, like I've never even considered what it might feel like to start losing my hearing or my eyesight or like imagine losing, I don't know, like, any part of you that makes you able to do your job. And while some of you might be thinking, oh, that would be great, then I can get off on disability. I know I, that's probably burnout speaking, but you know, for the sake of someone who clearly is not in that place right now, I was so moved by the secret because it really gave me a perspective of someone else and other generations like older than us and what they can teach us. And I think it just creates a better understanding of other people's lives. And it allowed me to connect to this person that I don't even know, but to feel what it must be like to be in their position and almost in a way in some weird roundabout way also appreciate what I have now that I might have not appreciated had I not read this, like my ability to hear well for now. And then we also get devastating secrets like this one that says, I accidentally killed a llama with telazoline. Now I know they are sensitive. 
and oh god i just can't imagine what this person might have been going through when they found that out and when that situation occurred and i just feel like it's definitely a tough place to be and they're not alone like we've all been in similar situations like this and if you haven't yet you probably will be in some version of this story and i think being able to share and read and know that someone's listening is so important for realizing that you're not alone and i hope this person knows that and that you know that if you've gone through something similar but we also get pretty happy funny secrets as well but you know guys every time i post like the funny happy ones on instagram or tiktok or whatever it does not nearly get as much feedback or quote unquote engagement, should I say, as like the more negative, more devastating ones. And that might just be the way our brains work, or I'm not sure what it is. But I still love the funny ones. I think they're great. There's so many funny things people say and do in our field, in our profession. I think we need to share more stories like this. And this one says, the favorite thing I ever had a client tell me was I needed to seduce her dog to look in its ears. I am really hoping she meant sedate. <laughs> oh, guys, I have like messages popping up on my screen while I'm filming this. And I hope that you're not reading. I don't know if it's going to come up or not. But anyway, it's my sister. She's coming over. She's bringing the chicken. But... <laughs> Sorry, that's why I'm also laughing as I'm reading this funny secret. But this secret is also really funny because after the person submitted it, this was again at a live conference, they came up to me and it was actually one of my old classmates from vet school that we ran into each other again in Kansas City and he's from Canada. And it made this secret even funnier because he's actually like a outwardly a really serious person. I mean, he has a great sense of humor, but I just imagine like, imagine the most serious person that you know and someone telling them, you need to seduce my dog in order to look in her ears. <laughs> and that person just being like, what? Really hoping she meant sedate. <laughs> so just stories like that, which I do share a lot on the veterinary confessionals and I love sharing and it's another way of connecting. So it's not like we only connect on negative things. We can connect on funny, happy, pensive things as well, like any category. So lastly, I'm just going to talk a little bit about traumatic stress and the main reason I've decided to make this course. And it's basically because, like I said earlier, that traumatic stress actually runs rampant in our industry. And I don't know how we can solve a problem if we don't fully understand it. Like, how are we going to solve the problems of burnout, compassion, fatigue, even suicide, if we're not even aware that traumatic stress plays a pretty big role in our well-being? And that by being in the veterinary profession, we are exposed to more of it. So my goal is through these lectures, help you guys also gain a better understanding of your own experiences and just traumatic stress in general. And I hope that you share it with others that if you find this useful, but mostly I hope that it can benefit your life to make your quality of life better. And whether you decide to stay in practice or not, doesn't matter. Hopefully it will make a more sustainable practice for you, but maybe you'll go on to do something else and that's okay too. And lastly, I just want to end with trigger warnings. This is throughout this course basically going to 
kind of be important that things are going to come up. Like this isn't always an easy journey of self-discovery and self-learning. And anyone in the wellness industry who really does the work will tell you a lot of times it's not easy, but it's worth it. So when something comes up or you feel triggered, you can feel overwhelmed. So sometimes it's a positive trigger. Sometimes it's a negative trigger, but I basically say these are like light bulb moments and I really encourage you to write it down. Pause the lecture, pause what I'm saying, pause the situation, pause what you're reading and think about how it made you feel and then what happened after and just write it down. So those are my words of encouragement and I know it's cliche, but if you don't take care of yourself, you're truly not going to be in a position to be able to help others as well. And not everyone's lucky enough to have people taking care of them. Like my dad's job, basically the government supplied all his basic needs to be met because they understood like he had a driver, he had a cook, he had people like a housekeeper and whenever we were overseas. And that's because the government understood the importance of someone being well-fed, well taken care of in order to be able to show up their job and do the hard thing every day. And our jobs are not easy. We deal with high stakes situations all the time. We deal with life and death all the time. We deal with other people's trauma all the time. So why why not understand that like our exposure creates things that we need to take care of in order to not only protect our own well-being, but also do a better job with being there for not only our patients and our clients, but also our friends and our family and our loved ones. So I hope that this has been informative for you and I'll see you soon. So thanks for listening and have a good rest of your day.